Guys, welcome to Lake Chelan Airport in Washington State. Listen, this is one of the most beautiful places you'll ever see. And today is the first of our new Ride Along Epic Job series, where we show you some of the coolest, most craziest professions all over the world. And this episode, we're gonna show you how farmers use helicopters to save and grow their crops. So we're going to meet up with our good friend, Ryan McDonald from North Wind Aviation. Yeah, let's go. What's up, dude? My name's Ryan McDonald, and I'm the founder and owner and general operations manager of Northwind Aviation. This guy not only is got an amazing business that we're about to show you all about, but he's also a good friend of ours. The reason we decided to start with Ryan is because a, like I said, his business is fascinating. They do some really cool stuff. And B, since this is a new series, we're getting started. This will help us work out some bugs. So you're like a little bit of a test, test, uh, what's the word? Test dummy? Test dummy. Yeah, test dummy. So Crash test dummy. And that's what I'm all fun. right being the You good with that? Model? Yeah. <laughs> so what are we doing? I'm going to run you guys out down south mm -hmm. and we're going to go out and look at what we do with helicopters and crop dusting. Um, we've got a situation where heat has um, stop some of the growth of the onions and potatoes for some customers. So we're going to go down there and spike that growth with some fertilizer and help them recover a little bit quicker. And then we're going to come back up here. We're going to go up to uh, Stamil Hill. I'm going to show you guys some cherries and what we got going on with the cherry farm. Northwind primarily does agricultural services. Um, the bulk of our business supports the farming efforts throughout central and northern Washington, whether it be from cherry tree fruit growers, or supporting the row crop growers down in the basin. Um, another big division is forestry. Uh, we do a fair amount of uh, timber spraying to support the reforestation and, and the farming practices of timber uh, throughout Oregon and Washington. And we also have divisions that do power line uh, construction and patrols, and we also do fire. So we have a Huey that's out supporting the wildland fire efforts throughout the summer. The bulk of our business supports the farming efforts throughout central and northern Washington. Uh, we do a fair amount of uh, timber spraying to support the reforestation and practices of timber. On our trip here to Washington to see Northwind helicopters, we had to leave Salt Lake around 2 a.m. Well, we were supposed to leave at 2 a.m. We, we left around 3 a.m. Yeah, because we had some issues getting the airplane out of the hangar. So that set us back a little bit. Luckily, uh, Ryan was up in Washington waiting for us. He had the truck at the airport. So when we landed, which was right around 4.30, 4.45-ish in the morning, um, he picked us up and we were able to go straight to the first job. It's 5 a.m. here in Basin City, Washington. As you can see, we're on a uh, farm. This is Ryan's Air Base. Uh, it's actually kind of cool if you look right over here. This is a really old airstrip for the crop dusters. So this little paved path right here is where they used to land the crop dusters in and out of here. It's just this raggedy old strip. So basically what happens here is Ryan's got his big semi truck here with all the spray uh, fertilizer. He's got a shop there, um, the hangar, and then he's got a helicopter that uh, he keeps based here. So right now we're getting ready to have kind of a uh, team meeting with uh, Ryan and his crew to figure out what the plan is. And then uh, once we get everything together, we will show you every step of how they take the fertilizer, mix it in the batch truck, bring the helicopter over, load it, and then spray up and down. I think we're doing the orchard right here. I don't think, maybe, we, I'm not sure what we're doing. We might be doing the orchard, might be doing the field. All I know is that it's early. We've, we've already been up for three hours and uh, it'll be a long day. What I'm gonna do, Dave, grab um, flex. Not ball to stay together, yeah. Take the whole thing, just take the whole thing and set it on there. All right, our first helicopter of the day 
is coming in right now. Uh, one, of Ryan's, one of Ryan's pilots is coming in. He'll be landing right here. Look at him, hot dogging. Look at this thing. You've got a, uh, this is a Bell 206, um, a Jet Ranger. This is the helicopter that I learned how to fly in, this exact same model. Um, I bought it, flew it home from Tennessee, and, and that's what I got my license in. But you can see this whole spray system on here. It all has to be certified to be put on the aircraft. You can't just go build your own system. But each one of these nozzles right here is like a giant sprinkler. And uh, it's connected to that tank underneath there. And everything has to be super, super lightweight because this helicopter is very sensitive to weight. I think the total max load this helicopter can take is like, what's this, 1,200 pounds? 3,200 pounds gross weighs we can go up with. And empty is right around 2,000 pounds. So by the time you add fuel, pilot, uh, chemicals, water, all that kind of stuff, you got to be super sensitive. So 70, 80 gallons of material they take up at a time and then they run that through these uh, through this whole you know spray system. So this is a 32 foot boom assembly, but by the time you get up in the air and you start spraying, that the swath of the, of the product that's hitting the ground is anywhere between 40 and 50 feet wide. So they can go 40, 50 feet, big uh, paths at a time. And they can cover a lot of ground that way. So cool thing about this is it's very precise. So one of the things that's unique about helicopters and one of the reasons why we use them for aerial applications is the convenience factor. Um, air is quite quick versus ground. And the reason why helicopters are also utilized perhaps sometimes over an airplane is the tight confined spaces that we can operate in. Guys, we're gonna take a quick break from the video because I need to read to you this message that I just received um, from one of our video sponsors. All right, this is from a company called Credit MRI and you guys have probably seen their ads on our channel forever. And um, it's a great partner of ours. They sponsor a ton of videos and the reason why we continue to run ads for them is they do a really good job. They have a great product and a great service. And this message I just received basically just backs up that claim. So they're a credit repair company, right? They're a company that can go out and remove negative items from your credit and they'll do it without charging you any money up front. So they only charge you when they actually provide results, which is like unheard of in this industry. Anyways, the message is from one of you, a YouTube viewer who saw them on our channel, reached out and gave them a shot at repairing your credit. And it says, thank you, Credit MRI. We've been working with you since March and we had a 300 point jump. We were finally able to get an auto loan with a good interest rate. Next up, a home loan. We can't thank you enough. Guys, 300 points is a big freaking deal. That's like going from a 400 credit score to a 700. That's the difference between being able to buy a house or a car or even get a cell phone plan and not being able to do those things. Like that's a big deal. Uh, cool thing about Credit MRI is they can remove collections, um, charge-offs, student loans, medical bills, bankruptcies, late payments, uh, foreclosures, all these different things that screw up your credit. They can like dive in there and get those removed quickly. And what happens when, when they do that is your score goes up, which means your interest rates go down, which means you get better loans, you qualify for things that you didn't in the past. Like overall, having good credit is a great thing. What, even if you don't get a bunch of loans, like credit affects you in more ways than you understand. And the reason why this company stands out to me and the reason why it's a partner of ours forever is because they don't charge you until they do anything. Like I said, that's a big deal in the credit repair business. Like most companies will say, give us a bunch of money and then we'll try to get some results. No, these guys say, let us go to work. If we get anything done for you, bam, here's the invoice. Pay us for the work that we did. Don't pay us for anything we didn't do. And if you click the link in my description below, go to their website, Use the promo code SPARK7, you're gonna get $20 off your first invoice with them. Guys, I would not promote a company that I didn't believe in, and I continue to see like positive results from these guys. Great company, uh, veteran owned and operated, um, just good, solid people. So if you got bad credit, click the link in my description below and give them a shot. We're loading up the fertilizer and the fungicide right now. So all these pallets over here are different products. So those uh, fertilizers, fungicides, different types of stuff, are all gonna go in that giant tank right there. We're gonna mix it over the site. It's funny because I heard that one ounce of uh, one of those little bottles over there covers one full acre of crops. Kind of crazy. And, uh, it's gonna make it easier, especially since we have two guys. But that's what that's for. Correct. Okay. Yep. Make sure I wasn't... So the idea is um, we can fly heavier because we can take off in ground effect. Uh -huh. So we can fly like another 10 gallons of material. Ooh. And it's flat and be 
beautiful out there, so no problem. Hey guys, check it out. Ah, uh, wing windows. Best nice. AC ever invented. The first thing that Ryan wanted to show us up here was how they use the helicopters to basically do, I don't think crop dusting is the word they use for it, but it's the easiest way to explain it. It's spraying. So they take fertilizer, they take all sorts of different materials and they spray it over the crops to help them grow, to help them survive, like the recent heat wave that came through. So one thing that people probably don't realize is how much farmland there really is in Washington. All right, so we are at spray zone number one. Uh, this is also gonna be the landing zone. Now, a couple things you gotta be aware of. See this? This is really loose, loamy, dusty dirt. That's not good for helicopters. So basically, we're gonna set up a sprinkler right here to wet this whole area down because when the helicopter comes in, the last thing we wanna do is be working in the big dust storm. So um, we're gonna wet the whole, whole uh, strip here down with a sprinkler so that there's no dust. things first Ryan hands me an apron some rubber gloves make sure that I got my boots on and gives me the secret recipe to fertilize the crops I graduated I'm now the chef I'm the chef of the fertilizer you mix a couple bags of flex you put in a couple cups of pristine you add some warrior by a big bada boom you got the perfect batch to keep the crops perfectly healthy and keep you healthy I've never seen a chef with uh, ear protection on. Ever? Happy birthday, Corn Day, birthday, Corn Day, Ah, all the waiters are real mouthy, so I just put on some headphones on to listen to them. No, no, no. Four and a half bags of flex. I'm gonna give the secret recipe out. Don't do it. Don't give it away. Four and a half bags of flex. No, this is the family recipe. Don't give it away. You made a you made a wonderful solution that made the crops grow. Four jugs of pristine. <laughs> So mixing the fertilizer is just one part of what had to be done here today because from there, as the helicopter comes in for the landing, we have to run a hose out, hook it to the tank, and then we have to pump um, the fluids into the tank of the helicopter. We have to make sure he's topped off on fuel. So we were running fuel into the helicopter back and forth. And then on top of all that, we have to make sure that he's safe and good to take off again. So you unhook all the hoses, make sure you're good. You make eye contact with the pilot, you give him eat. a solid thumbs up and he knows you're good. He takes off, takes him roughly five minutes to do uh, the, the whole, you know, 70, 80 gallons of product across the field, mm -hmm. comes back, lands, we fill them up. So you burn through, um, you know, the solution pretty quick because 80 gallons across five minutes make good time. So I think we had uh, 200 acres to do and we got it done in just about two hours. I was in the kitchen the whole time, just mixing yeah, up you batches. Were. You were born for that. I did pretty good, I felt like. Yeah. I mean, a pretty important job. If you get that mixture wrong, the crops don't grow or they burn up. So. Really, a lot was weighing on my shoulders. You had to do something because you didn't bring a CDL to be able to drive the truck. I had my certified Dave license. <laughs> <laughs> Got it! <he>. Got it! <laughs> the crazy thing about this specific uh, task is everything's moving so fast that the ground crew and the pilot have to be in like total sync. Every time you hear that helicopter engine running, it's literally, you know, dollars lots of dollars per minute that it's that it's uh, burning and so you got to use that time wisely but at the same time you got to make sure you're safe so it's one of those things where you want to have a well-trained crew you want to make sure everybody is on the same page and you want to make sure that everybody is 
being overly cautious and over checking things. It's better to over check something in aviation than not check it and end up with a problem. One thing you gotta realize, anytime you're around helicopters, big, little, doesn't matter, just stay away from the tail. Uh, they've got that tail rotor back there that's spinning about you know seven, eight times faster than the main rotor blade, and it will slice you to pieces. There's videos out there where people aren't paying attention, and unfortunately, it's killed people. So, uh, whereas like on my red helicopter, the one you guys see me flying around all the time, tail rotor is like 14 feet in the air. I couldn't even jump up and reach it if I wanted to. So they're all different, but one habit you want to learn is just don't go around the tail of the helicopter. If you're getting out or getting in, always go around the front. So now that we're done spraying the field, uh, we're gonna jump in Ryan's Long Ranger helicopter and fly up to his home base up uh, near um, Lake Chelan. So it's roughly a 20, 30 minute flight north. Um, and when we get up there, we're gonna get there just in time to find um, Bruce, who's over at one of the cherry orchards, uh, spraying a product called ULV, which is basically this really low volume kind of a mist that kills the fruit flies above the orchards. So we just landed at uh, one of Ryan's northern bases here near uh, Wenatchee, Washington. And this, is where, friend. this is where they base all the helicopters for the cherry orchards, for the drying and the spraying. And we're about to introduce you to an old friend of ours. Oh. This is what we call Mike Kilo. 9-3 Mike Kilo was my first helicopter I ever owned. And uh, I memory. sold it a, you know, a couple years ago to a friend of Ryan's who apparently is leasing it back to Ryan now, and I didn't know that. Last year. I bought this thing in 2016. Flew it like crazy, got my license in it. In fact, I bought this helicopter down in Tennessee. When I first bought it, I wasn't, I thought it was normal. It was like a weird little hop. And the other pilots that flew it with me kind of were like, oh, that's normal, that's fine. And then Ryan, actually, this is how I met Ryan. Ryan came down to buy this helicopter from me in like 2017, because it was listed online. I'd never met him, he calls me, he comes down, looks at it, jumps in it, we fly around the valley, and, is your igniter on? Oh, it's a sprinkler. Yeah. Um, <laughs> flies around the valley and he's like, all right, got major problems with this helicopter. I'm not gonna buy it, but I'll help you fix it. And I was like, okay, we're friends now. And we shook hands <laughs> and we were buddies. And literally, uh, ever since then, we chased it for like two years, right? This phantom. Found it, finally found them all. Yeah, just weird little. So the previous owners of this helicopter hid some stuff, hid a lot of stuff from me. And some mechanics should have lost their license. Multiple mechanics should have lost their licenses because they overlooked some very dangerous things. I. I flew this to the point where the rotor head could have potentially popped right off because of some of the shoddy work that was done on it. But Ryan took it, you know, brought it in, made it his own, made it part of the family, got it flying perfect, and here she is. Right? Yep. Yeah, she's good running machine now. Good to go. That's got a lot of memories in that helicopter flying it's my machine, family around. They can all be fixed. That was one amazing time. As you can see, we're in one helicopter and Bruce is in the other helicopter spraying the orchard. We're keeping a safe distance from Bruce because as you can see, he's got his hands full down there. He is applying the product, he's watching out for power lines, he's doing these big turns, and since these orchards are in small, tight little configurations, he's got to do like pass after pass after pass. Like he's turning and burning a lot and there's a lot that he has to keep his eyes on. So we're keeping a safe distance, but we also want to get close enough so you guys can see just what it looks like. He's flying, I don't know, 10, 15 feet above the treetops, because basically the product that he's spraying right now, you want it to kind of settle in from the top of the tree down to right around the middle of the tree, because that's where the fruit flies like to hang out. The only good bug is a dead bug. If he wasn't spraying this, the fruit flies would destroy this orchard in a matter of days. Ryan has been telling me about this place called Stahican. And I thought it was just like a town, right? Like just a cool place to go and check out. And we've been trying to go do dinner there, camp there for a long time. And every time we come up here, we get busy and have something else going on. So this time around, he's like, I'm gonna make it happen. We're going to Stahican. And Stahican is a place where you can only get to by air or by boat because it's at the very top end of Lake Chelan. It's basically tucked between the top of Lake Chelan and the mountains that go to Seattle. So there, you can't get there by road. Um, so there's a barge that you can take. But keep in mind, this lake is 54 miles long, so that's a long boat ride. Or you can jump in Ryan's beautiful Long Ranger helicopter and be there in, well, 20, 30 minutes. So that's what we decided to do. And as we're flying up the lake, it just starts getting prettier and cooler, and the trees start getting bigger, and the air starts getting cooler, and the waterfalls start getting bluer and more majestic until we get to this place that literally looks like the Swiss Alps. And we land in this beautiful green grassy field,
pole right there. No way. This From looks like top? Switzerland. It does. It feels a lot like Switzerland. I've never been to Switzerland, but it feels like <laughs> the pictures. It really does. Like this is like the Swiss Alps. <laughs> yeah. It's so pretty. And we'll fly the whole canyon, Austria. and then once we get out to this plateau, we pitch <laughs> and then, and then land here. right here. This amazing cabin, these amazing people, Cliff and his wife come out and meet us and say, welcome to Tahikin Valley Ranch, come enjoy dinner. I just did not see that coming. That was like, I knew it was gonna be cool because Ryan doesn't do things that aren't cool. He does things that are super trick and you know. Uh, <laughs> the trick is the trick. One thing Ryan says a lot is trick. super trick. He says, that'll That's be super, super trick, trick or slick, so. He's uh, got the soul of a 75-year-old man. Hey, old man river, zip it or I'll break your hip. So anyways, Stahican, man. I mean, what else can you say about it? That's the most beautiful place I've ever landed a helicopter in. Easily. Tall, green mountains, pine trees as far as I can see. Perfect water that I was just craving. All I want to do is swim in the water, jump off the bridge. I will be back, Stahican. Yeah. I can promise you that. Just, you know, throwing that out there. <laughs> well, I took one bicycle on a single track, and I'm never going to leave it, leave it down. Well, Oddly I'm, similar. Yeah. <laughs> we only know one way to roll. Yeah. Um, it's like we're like, spinning out on rocks. And Marshall? Wow. So there's a trail system. Every thought all the time. That's why I sit and <laughs> read about all this stuff. I, 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 just ran ran the the video. I thought it was pretty inspirational, actually. It's very inspirational. Yeah, but and but the then sunlight, what? And the sunlight, the sun, and the air, and the dirt, they mix everything. No, they don't take the dirt. Listen, man, I'm a guy who makes batter. Okay, I make batches of. You, you don't make that's fine. You mix a whole bunch of things together, make something glorious. It's not just one. Thing. It's don't not just the air. Honestly, don't compare yourself to a tree right now. It's I'm not. I do. That's exactly what you're doing. No, that's exactly. You're not picking up my. You're not picking up what I'm putting down at all. What are you putting down? I'm a batch maker. I was talking about today how I mix chemicals to fertilize the earth. You're comparing it to a tree making itself. That's how I made those trees with the fertilizer. So you're comparing it. chance you should check out Stahican, especially yeah. Stahican Valley Ranch. I'd stay away. You guys don't want to go. Oh yeah, it's full, right? Yeah, it's full. That was a great way to end day one up here in Washington. Uh, amazing dinner in an amazing place. And then uh, we headed down to Ryan's house and just crashed. He has a cool place right on the Columbia River and uh, we're setting up for day two. All right guys, that wraps up day one of flying with Northwind Aviation up here in uh, Wenatchee, Washington. Today was crazy, you know. Um, you guys saw the footage. Ryan took us to the freaking Swiss Alps, right here in America. Like that was insane. Took us, I think it was the Stahican Valley Ranch is the name of the place. It's a little family run operation up there. We landed in one of the most beautiful settings I've ever been to. Went in and had one of the most like delicious dinners I've ever had in my entire life. Some of the best service, the most friendly people. Like that was so unexpected. It was when we were spending the night. He has a house right here on the Columbia River, which is like one of the coolest setups in the world. Huge backyard. We're all gonna take a dip in the river here in a little bit. And then tomorrow we got a big day. Um, we're gonna show you how they save cherry crops with helicopters. So I'm super stoked to show you guys that. You told me that it was a nice place to have dinner. You took this the most magical place I've ever been. It was a nice place to have dinner, wasn't it? <laughs> I really hope the footage does it justice because there's, I've never been anywhere like that. It's like you're flying over the lake and, and it just keeps getting better and better and better. And then it's like, okay, this is like dreamy. And then it's like, okay, this is, I'm, I'm in a dream. 
And then you're like, okay, no, I'm at, I'm at a theme park because this can't be real. It's a simulation. And it just keeps getting crazier and crazier. And then the food, just, I'm telling you, Stahican. Stahican Valley Ranch, right? Yep, Stahican Valley Ranch. Uh, Cliff? Yep, Cliff Cl Courtney. Cliff Courtney is the owner of Stahican Valley Ranch. Thank you so much for having us, Cliff. Anybody, whoever gets the chance, do it. Do it. Do it. But, no, the salmon come through here and... There's sturgeon in the river. You got sturgeon? Yeah. You caught one of those? Yep. The Twelve and a half feet. The when I raised the river, they flooded all of that, and they moved everybody to the other side. Um, you don't really bite as much as kind of cold. Cool. So you ate the 12 foot sturgeon. Dave off. Yeah. What? They do 12 and 12. 12 on, 12 off, 12 on. So day two up at Ryan's place is the one that I've been most excited about because this is how I kind of got to know Ryan a little bit because he, he when we first started talking, it was about uh, this business that he has, drying cherries. I didn't quite fully understand the process of drying cherries, but now you're about to see why it's so intriguing. Guys, welcome to the Cherry Orchard and welcome to day two of Riding Along with Northwind Aviation. Today we're gonna show you something super fascinating. In fact, it's one of the coolest things that I have ever learned um, about farming and aviation and all sorts of different stuff. Today we're gonna show you how helicopters make it possible for you and I to enjoy delicious cherries just like these. You see, growing cherries is really hard. Actually, growing them is easy. Maintaining them and keeping them alive and harvesting them and getting them to your doorstep without them looking like that, full-blown craisins, is extremely difficult. We're gonna show you what happened to this crop and why it's still on the tree and it's all just gonna die and not be picked. We're gonna show you how to prevent that from happening. We're gonna show you how a helicopter flying above us can solve all these problems. Guys, buckle up because this process is extremely fascinating. So right now we're walking into the orchard. Uh, orchard is obviously just big rows of trees with either grass or some sort of like material between each tree. This is Bruce. Bruce is uh, the pilot we're gonna be watching today. Uh, Bruce is also a wealth of knowledge. You know just about everything about cherries, or enough to be dangerous. Enough to be dangerous. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so Bruce is obviously gonna fly over us here in a minute to show you exactly why they fly over the trees with the uh, helicopters. But we're also, before we get to that, I wanna show you what's happening with these, like, Bruce, what happened here? Why are these cherries still on the tree? Yeah, they're on the tree primarily because they sunburnt. They look like that versus yeah. this here. That's how they're supposed to look. Yeah, it's supposed to have a nice shine to them instead of this. You see the difference between them? Oh, yeah. And you can even see on the bottoms of them here where these were affected by the sun as well. And then you can see where they had a rain that came through way early and they got splits right in the very bottom of the cherry, which also makes them a cold and they have to throw them away, so. Yesterday when we saw you spraying, you were spraying a ULV, which is basically an insecticide, Correct. right? Yeah. It's a very, very low volume, kind of stays in the tree stop, the tree tops, kills the fruit flies, and then just the UV breaks it down, right? Yes. So that's one thing that a lot of people don't understand. People see that you spray in and they're thinking that you're just poisoning the neighborhood. What they don't realize is that science has made it so that what you're spraying only lasts long enough to kill the bug and then it just basically it disappears. Goes away, can't right? find it. Yeah. yeah. So this farmer with this crop, since the sun came through, you guys had a heat wave, obviously you guys did your job, but you can't stop the sun. Right. These cherries now are just gonna fall? Yep, they're gonna fall off, hit the ground. They're gonna probably spray them one more time with a product called dimethylate and uh, to, it'll, call, it'll take care of the cherry fruit fly that's still left out in here. You still gotta spray them because the fruit fly are on a 12 to 14 day, they'll have another hatch. Right. And so they still have to spray them to keep the fruit fly from going nuts in here and taking over. Bugs. They suck. Yeah. So they'll spray them with that product, which also causes these to eventually shrivel up faster than they already are. Right. And they'll start falling on. When they fall off with the, with the spray, are they falling off at the top of the stem? Both. So they're kind of just wherever it breaks first, which is, right. what'd you call this area? Where the, the stem breaks, obsession? Obsession, there's an obsession layer right here on these things. That's part of the, where the stem is broke off. If you see right there. Okay. That little place right there where they want, that's where you they want you to pick them. And instead of taking this piece off, this is 
That's a bud. Yeah. So I, I broke the bud. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I owe them one bud. Yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway, they, you want that's how they want to pull them off the tree is just like that instead of taking this all with them and a bunch of leaf material with them. So, but anyway, you could probably go graft that into your tree at home. So Bruce was just telling me that if they don't get these old rotten cherries off of this, then the tree preparing for next year's crop can't send nutrients to the bud because it's got all these old dead ones yeah, hanging on it, right? trying to produce these. Right. So basically, you're going to spray it. These are all going to fall to the ground. Do they just compost them? They just turn into dirt? They just turn into raisins. Turn into raisins. So cherries are super fragile. Right, and you don't have a long time from by the time it's ripe on the tree to when it's gotta be in a consumer's mouth. How long do you have? Uh, it depends on the year. Yeah. The year's like this, a lot faster. Yeah. You know, you don't want them, you wanna get them packed and to the sales people and gone into the grocery store for the consumer. Usually they don't like to be have them in there much more than about six to 10 days. From the time they were picked? From the time they're picked. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, they're on the road. A lot of times they'll pick them and the same night or the next morning they're in a truck going somewhere. Yeah. So that's insane. And this was a really good year, right? These trees are real heavy, they're real loaded down, and yeah. unfortunately these ones got burnt. So yeah. it's it's a crop that's lost, which is a lot of money lost. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um so the most interesting thing I ever learned about helicopters and farming was when I heard cherry drying. And Ryan always told me cherry drying, cherry drying. So I thought that was them flying over the, the orchard and spraying something that dried the orchard. It's way more simple than that. Yeah. If there's water on the trees, you hover over and you shake the water off the trees. Yeah. Okay, what you're trying to do is you want to turn that cherry up so that water runs out. And you want to kind of get them where they're in clusters like this. You want to rattle them around so yeah. that water has a place to get out of there. Right. And if they roll up like that and you get it out of there, and now you get years when it keeps raining mm -hmm. for hours and hours. You know, sometimes you can get days where it rains eight hours. Those years are you're fighting against mother nature and yeah. you're probably not going to win too well depending on the stage of the cherries really yeah and different trees react to water differently yeah. some cherries will like a uh, lap and like is up on that hill will take a lot more water than the skiing as well here's the unique thing that i learned about ryan because I, I actually learned about this because my original helicopter that i had ryan said hey if you're gonna get rid of it let's put it up on a cherry contract and i was like What's a cherry contract? Cherry contract means a farmer that has a group of orchards is worried about rain. He says, bring your helicopter over, park it near my, my cherries so that if there's a rainstorm, you can get in the air immediately and dry those cherries off. So part of Ryan's business is he gets paid to have helicopters sit. Literally, I got a check each month for my helicopter just sitting. Didn't fly at all. And then it flew once and then you get to bill per hour that you fly over the helicopter or you fly over the cherries. So it's a really unique business model because not very often do you get a pay get paid to just have equipment sitting around but it's kind of insurance for the farmers because one rainstorm or, or one you know good batch of water on these cherries could wipe out the whole crop right yep. so it's a small price to pay to have a helicopter on standby to save your cherries rather than letting them all rot and and, uh, and split because once a cherry gets a split in it it's just like us like if we get a cut and we don't take care of it it gets infected right yep. it's fascinating it's science what's the perfect environment for a cherry yeah, you know, 85 degree, 80 to 90 degree weather with nights that are like 60s, you know, low 60s, mid 60s. Preferably that's, no rain. No rain, yeah. That's, that's the only farmer in the world who wishes for no rain. Yeah. But the water damage one still tastes great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when you pick them from the tree, there's no real issue with picking a tree that has that little spit. Like it had the, the almost like a scab, when I mean, we cut our arm, right? It right. heals itself yeah. a little bit. The issue is when we get into the packing environment, now it's gonna go through these chillers and washes and get boxed and packaged. It'll open that scab back up. Exactly, the skin isn't impermeable anymore, right? It's a temporary fix for the fruit. So like a cut on your arm, it's gonna open up, take water, and then be a vector for, for outside stuff. And what's interesting to me is, so this whole crop right here is not gonna get picked, right? However, I will gladly eat that cherry because there's some good ones in here. It doesn't mean every cherry in here got bad. It just means the majority of them, it's not cost effective to come through and because most of them are bad, right? Most of them have been damaged or hurt in some way, but they're well, still- hasn't? We've all been hurt in some way, right? <laughs> True. <laughs> but they're really good cherries. If you've never had a cherry straight from a cherry tree, put it on your bucket list because it's a different experience. All right, guys, I'm about to do like the number one no-no for cherry farming. And that is get the trees 
soaking wet. So any cherry farmer watching this is probably like, you are, don't do that, you're an idiot. But I promise this is for the sake of science. We're gonna get these trees wet to show you just what happens when the helicopter flies over. So we're gonna get to use that hose. Oh, you want a hose? All right. You're about to give cherry farmers anxiety. Whoa, jeez. Yeah, get it, get it. Get that tree nice and wet. How many trees do you wanna do? <laughs> Let's get this batch right here, these four. Get them nice and soggy. Simulate a good <laughs> summer monsoon. No, not the jet stream, not the jet stream. Not there you go. Right here is a perfect example. Water in the cup, water on the bottom. This little cherry is like a little sponge. It's gonna start, start absorbing that, and it's gonna make that really delicate skin just pop. Doing it for the sake of science, guys. drench these trees with water, probably more than a rainstorm would be able to do. See that? There's no water in the cups of those cherries. You may see a little speckle out on the outside, but that's just gonna evaporate right away. Is this okay? Is that gonna hurt the cherry? Yeah, the small drops on the outside, we have individual drops, that's a non-issue. That'll evaporate like you say. What you don't want is the cups filled and everything saturated, because again, that stem will start taking that up and it'll pump it right into the bottom of the cherry split. So yeah, that's perfect. You're not gonna get all the humidity out, right. but you're gonna get all the standing water out. Right. Then it can evaporate. It's just, it's no different than, you know, going like this, except for it's way more gentle. See, how, look how many cherries are falling when you do that. So if you were to send somebody through here and try to like manually shake the tree or dry it that way, you're gonna lose half your crop just falling on the ground. I can do it because this crop is gonna be thrown away, but it's like, it's such a perfect fit for this, and it's a job that most people had no idea existed. The final thing we want to show you at the orchard was basically why helicopters are parked everywhere and not necessarily flying, and they don't have to fly to make money. Uh, so you're telling me at any point, 15 to 20 helicopters between here and Lake Chelan, which is what, maybe 20 miles? Yeah, we're 30 miles away. 30 miles. Like a 30 mile radius here in the valley has got a lot of helicopters just like that one, parked on ramps like this or at farms, waiting just waiting for that storm to come. Because let's say this farmer hanging out, growing his cherries, everything's going well, rain comes. He can't just pick up the phone and be like, hey, uh, Ryan, fly over here real quick and, and, and come down and do my cherries. No, Ryan has to have a helicopter and a crew here on standby in this region to be able to jump in and go. And you guys are at a moment's notice, ready yeah. to go. So, so initially when it started, that's kind of the process that happened. Guys would be calling into the shop, and this is way before my time, but. They'd be calling into the shop and ringing the phone and trying to get people to come and dry and it was very hectic. Some smarter people than me said, well, let's pool these folks together and organize this so they have a guaranteed response, right? So essentially what Northwind does, while we have our own aircraft, our primary function during this process is we're an insurance broker, yeah. right? So you're paying your normal premium just like you do for car insurance. And that insurance policy is having an aircraft that is available for your acreage the whole time you're vulnerable, 21 day period, okay? Then when it rains, then you're paying your deductible. You had an accident, they fix your car, that's what the helicopter's doing. It's, you had a rain event, they come out, they dry, okay? So why is it important for us to be in the middle? Is that because we're big enough, we're organizing lots of people together, we have a central command, so if someone Let's just say you're out drying, your helicopter doesn't start. 
well, you've engaged in an insurance contract with this farmer. Right. He's pissed right now. You're not starting. So you're able to call us and we go, okay, yep, we have another ship over here. We'll move him over. We take care of him. So that's the advantage for the guys that are flying for us. This is why your company, Northwind, is a farmer's choice because there's there's guys that pop up and do, you started with one helicopter. Yep. You've one been there, done yep. that. So there's guys that pop up and, and it's not a bad business, but it's also a very risky business because if you overcommit or you undercommit, you're either not gonna make enough money or you're not gonna be able to hit all the, all the cherries that need dried and it's risky business. So farmers are gonna take a look and say, okay, I can choose Joe Blow and maybe Joe Blow's rate is a little bit cheaper than Ryan's, mm -hmm. but Ryan has helicopters here, there. He's got pilots that know the valley. Bam, get on it and go. It's like buying cut rate insurance versus premium good insurance. I mean, it's no different. So what's cool to me though, and it's benefited me because I actually had a helicopter sitting on contract. Remember my, my red one over there to park a helicopter here and just sit it. That's part of getting, that's part of the business. And it gets paid to just sit here on the ramp, which is not a bad business model. I mean, it's really not. I mean, granted helicopters make more money when they're in the air, but to have a helicopter either sitting at my hangar in Salt Lake doing nothing or sitting up here on a cherry contract, well, makes more sense for me to have it sit up here all summer or the 21 day period or whatever it is rather than sitting nowhere because there's there's good money in it so that's why if you go to a cherry orchard or an area a region that grows does everybody do it this way pretty much yep um if you don't have uh air to dry you're going with your speed sprayers on mm -hmm. ground yeah um the disadvantage there is it takes a lot longer to cover the acreage right mm -hmm. so you're not going to get through all the acreage efficiently mm -hmm. right. and you're also blowing the water back up into the air and then some of it settles back down and you're not creating as much of a wind current as we are. Right. So a helicopter is by far choice. There are some times when you have to be careful with a helicopter though. So these are red cherries, right? And they're very durable. They take a little bit of beating and shaking. There's other cherries that are very light colored. Rainier specifically is something that people are know of the name and they're a yellow cherry that you see in the supermarket. We have to fly quite a bit higher on those cherries because we, we can't beat them together too much, right? Because right? they'll bruise and it'll look kind of funny on the skin. So there's some tactics there where um, the pilots that have been doing this a while, they know how far and, and how low and fast to fly to get an effective dry without beating the trees up. What are the risks to a pilot in cherry drying? Well, you're flying low to the ground. Um, you're typically, you're almost always out of ETL or essentially that flying portion, you're actually hovering. Um, and there's a lot of obstacles out there, right? So the orchards have trees and big power lines. There's other aircraft out there. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a very simple process to simply hover and make that happen. But also you really have to be on your toes and not be complacent because there's a lot of hazards to the environment that you're flying in. As a pilot, somebody who understands the hazards and obstacles of flying, this is a very challenging job. Because first of all, hovering as a new pilot, or you're somebody who's learning how to fly, hovering is the hardest part. Once you, you become a pilot, it's fine. It's not that big of a deal. You've got to make sure that you're following the pattern of the orchard. So you're looking at your, if you're spraying, for example, or whatever, you're looking at like the GPS, you're looking outside, and then you've got hazards and obstacles, power lines everywhere. For some reason, they make a joke. Like if you want to find a cherry orchard, just look for the power lines because there's, yeah. there's power lines freaking everywhere. Like it's like if you saw the footage from uh, Bruce flying yesterday, he's happened to pop up and over and around and they go up and do these big ag turns. So it's very complex flying. However, it's great experience. So if you want to build great experience and good time, come fly and dry cherries with Ryan because it's a great way to, to get good technical complex flying skills in a short amount of time. You know, I thought I knew a decent amount about what Ryan does, but after spending time here and, and seeing like the ground to the air operations and everything in between, I'm realizing like every single one of us, including all you viewers, if you've had a piece of fruit in the last, any, any time ever, that was probably helped produce by a helicopter, at least some of these you know tree fruits up here in, in the orchard areas. Um, it's crazy how much aircraft really impact everyone's lives. And that's something I'm starting to realize is, is there's so many people involved in the process of you eating a cherry like it is insane and there's so many steps involved from spraying this and spraying that and, and fertilizing and checking this and making sure they're dry and like man it is it is a process and that's before it even gets to the fruit packer yeah. and the fruit packer then has to package it and make sure it gets safely to you like it's wild they should charge a million dollars for a bag of cherries do you think you're going to hear helicopters every time you eat cherries from now on or do you I hear helicopters anyway 
I, every, anytime there's, if there's a helicopter within 10 miles, I'm hearing it. <laughs> I mean, obviously you guys can see that what Ryan does is super cool. It looks very sexy and glamorous from the outside, it's because it is, but what you now have seen and are probably starting to understand is there's a lot more that goes into this than just jumping in a you know, helicopter and flying around cool places. Get to the chopper! Uh, but one thing that I will say is Ryan and Northwind is always looking for good help. And because it's really hard, people come up here and they see the glamour side, they work for a day, a week, a month, however long, and they're like, man, that's, that's hard. So if you think you're a hard worker, if you think you've got good work ethic and you've got what it takes, hit them up. Uh, we're gonna put Ryan's contact information in the link in the description below. Um, they're always hiring, especially seasonal help. If, you, uh, if you're looking for a job, maybe, what did Ryan, May to September? So if you want some work up in Washington from May to September and you want to prove to Ryan that uh, you're a good fit for the team and that you can actually bring value and work in one of the coolest places in the world, you should definitely, definitely check it out. Anyone from ground crew to pilots, they're always looking for good help, but don't apply if you're a pussy. Yeah, don't. Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't, don't you need it. So the reason that it's a secret is because you're supposed to keep it to yourself. Well, if they're gonna come work here, they're gonna need to know the recipe. I don't know if Ryan's gonna be the one having you train the new recipe makers. Did you see how good I did? You did a great job, but you're still kind I of a rookie. I only ever filled the bucket once. <laughs> once out of four times. Five. Five, okay. I got you. Um, so anyways, guys, uh, this is cool. I'm, I'm pumped that we got a chance to show you this. Obviously, helicopters are our passion. We fly one around all the time, but this is a completely different use for helicopters. And hopefully this helps some of you who may have some sort of interest in aviation career um, or agriculture or utility work. Uh, any of the stuff these guys do, they do a little bit of everything. So it's, uh, it's fun, but it's extremely hard. Uh, there's a lot of risks involved, but I'd say it's one of the most rewarding careers you could have. I mean, look at Ryan. The guy's happy all the time. All the time. Because he does the coolest job in the world. Better. Should we, this where we plug his phone number so they can call him and apply for a job? 867-5309. Nailed it. Yeah. All right, well, should we go eat? Yeah.